Bio. So Nicholas Carlson is an associate professor at Linköping University in Sweden. He received his PhD in computer science from University of Saskatchewan in Canada. His main research interests are in the design, modeling, characterization, and performance evaluation of distributed systems and networks. He actively serves on international program committees and publishes research papers in leading conferences and journals. Uh, currently, his community involvement is uh, organizing ACM Sigmetrics, uh, Green Metrics Workshop, which is co-located with Sigmetrics Conference. And he was a TCP co-chair of IEEE Mascots in 2015. And he is also, uh, he was, he is an associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Sustainable Computing. And he's also the current chair of IEEE STC on Sustainable Computing and the treasurer of ACM segment. So he is actively involved in the research community. He does excellent research in distributed systems and performance evaluation. And today we will be hearing some exciting work that he has been doing on popularity dynamics as well as if there is some time left on third party of authentication. So it's several years of research coming together, so it will be really interesting to hear from him. Okay. Please start. Thank, thank, thanks, Anika. Uh, ha happy to see some, some people here, in, including from, from some of the communities you, 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 you mentioned. Uh, so I mean, th this is sort of the, the title of my talk. When I started doing the, the slides, it ended up being more like YouTube popularity dynamics, edge caching, third party authentication in the interactive video streaming. Or to translate it, some topics I'm really excited to talk about. Uh, and, and, and hopefully I, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily a very charismatic speaker, uh, but I will try to show that I actually is, is excited about these things. And, and if you don't believe me, just, just take my word for it. So, so before I start, I, I should say that I mean the, the work that I present here is is, is done in collaboration with, with numerous students and, and, and other collaborators. So, so it's not not only my work, but sort of a, a joint effort. Uh, I also want to set the talk in, in into some context. So, so as, as Annika had said, my, my interest is in design modeling and performance relations of distributed systems and networks. So what type of systems do I typically look at? Well, it's uh, content delivery networks. Uh, how do I try to understand these networks? Well, I, I try to model them, do measurements, uh, do some analytics to, to get, some, get some insights into them. I also is interested in, in sort of energy efficiency in network security. So, so some of these things that I'm going to talk about are, are security related as, as well, but, but primarily sort of some measurement and, and content delivery. So, so let's focus on, on this, this corner for, for this talk. So, so what, am I, what am I going to talk about? Well, in this talk I'm going to talk about modeling and understanding popularity dynamics so, so uh, say with, with YouTube, we upload videos. Uh, some videos become popular a week, and then they sort of fade out. Others become long-term pop popular. And and the question becomes, well, what makes one video more popular than, than another? Uh, if we then look at it sort of from a local perspective, what implications does it have? Well, it turns out that there's a skew, a high skew in, in the popularity, and, and this have implications for, for caching. So, so I want to say, say a little bit about what you see on the cat on an edge network and what implication it has for caching. I also want to tie in with sort of third party authentic authentication. So, so this is a landscape that we see more and more where we use Facebook to, to log in to some other services, etc. But there are some privacy implications here that, that, that I think are, are sort of neat. Uh, and then, I mean, in, in terms of my, my, my favorite topic, uh, content delivery, we, we have some new results that uh, I think have implication for, for these caching things where, where we now start having more and more immersive experiences. We, we might want to choose our own pass through a movie. Well, traditional content that when we do network measurements, look in one way. The, these type of experiment experiences 
are going to result in, in, in other traffic patterns, other caching opportunities. So, so I want to say, say a few words about that as well. Now, so let's get started. We, we, we know roughly what I'm going to talk about. So the first thing is, well, why am I interested in, in video streaming? Well, if, if we go to a, a typical user's internet usage, much of it is, is, is using things like Netflix, YouTube, etc., etc. And turns out that we are using it uh, with more and more type of devices. So, so not only are we using our desktop or laptops or TVs, etc., to access this, the, these services. This has resulted in, in the majority of traffic being due to streaming services. And, and by 2020, it's projected to, to be an, an even larger portion. So, so say 80%, who, who knows? So, so if you now have an internet that, that carry all this, this video streaming traffic and, and these services, delivering these services, we need to understand them. So, so here measurement com comes in so that we can understand what we try, try to design scalable and efficient systems for. Now, my first story is gonna be about some, some work we've been doing on, on popularity dynamics. So, so, so published a couple of years ago. So, so what is the motivation here? Well, if, if you look at this massive amount of video, not only is it massive, but it also impact uh, how we spread thoughts, opinions, etc. So if we take two videos, say these two, they're not gonna become equally popular. So what is it that make one video more popular than, than the other? So if we take this dog and cat movie, how many think that the dog movie should be more popular? Clearly. Uh, cat movie, unfortunately we have some cat friends here, uh, so the cat friends are wrong and the dog people are right. So the right answer is this, so with no bias at all, uh, I have a dog by the way. <laughs> so, so I mean if, if we do this we get some popularity distribution, okay? And if we do it for more videos, we get something that looks like this. So, so here I ranked videos from, from the most popular to the least popular. And we see there's a long tail of uh, videos that get very few, but then we have this red region where, where you have some that get most of the views. And if we do this for YouTube, that's what we're gonna see. If we do it for say BitTorrent globally, we get the similar distribution. If we do it BitTorrent at campus network, we get the same thing. If we do it for web traffic, we get the same thing. If we do it for services, we get the same thing. So what is it with this distribution? Well, uh, this is actually related, and, and, and Aniket has, has a really nice article that explains so, sort of this, uh, this behavior. So, so, so we see a SIF distribution. So what is the SIF distribution? Well, essentially, the, the number of views a video is going to have is going to be proportional to the rank raised to some negative power. And the neat thing with this is if we take the log of both sides, what we get is a linear relationship. So what we end up seeing is something that looks like this. In practice, we don't necessarily always get a straight line. So in practice, we get something that looks like this. So we have some curvature in the beginning and some curvature at the end. So this is the head and the tail of the distribution. The shape of these parts depends various between services, but also depending on what uh, time span we're measuring things over. So if we take it over a day or, or a week, it might be a very straight line. But if we look over a longer period of time, we get these type of curvatures. And, and part of that is, is due to churn in, in popularity. So, so a video that is most popular now might not be most popular in a month from now. And, and it also depends on the sampling method. So, so we've done, done various work in this one, in, in this domain. What I wanna focus on is, is this lifetime versus current and, and the churn that we see. So, so if we do measurement over, over YouTube and, and, and we look at say the total views thus far, it turns out that that's a pretty good predictor of what you're gonna see in the next week. So, so this is called the rich get richer effect. So essentially the more we just, uh, 
the more views a video have, the more likely it is to see views the, the following week. Now, we also see that there's a lot of spread here. So, so it, it's, it's not a straight line. So, so, so it, it's highly non-stationary. Turns out that if you did this over weeks and, and look at the views you see in week one as a prediction for week two, for week four to five and so forth, you see a less and less variation. So, so this shows that there's some long-term uh, station or popularity. So, so it's the popularity becomes more, more and more stationary. So, so that's one insight, and, and, and we're going to look, look a little bit more at, at this distribution later. First, I want to get back to, to, to these cats and the dogs. So, so some of these popularity differences are due to the content. So the dog content maybe is just much better than the cat content. However, it might also depend on other things. So, so it might depend on the, the uploader's social network. It might depend on which keywords were used, or it might depend on the view counts thus far, directly, and not on the content itself. But it's very difficult to, to capture these things. So we have an intuition, well, more keywords maybe give more, uh, more views. Maybe a bigger social network give more views. But typically, it's very difficult to capture it. And, and most of these works that have been looking at rich get richer completely ignore the, these aspects. So what we did in this work was, was that we developed and applied a methodology that they're able to both accurately both assess both quantitatively and qualitatively the impact of various content agnostics factors. Okay. So how did we do that? Well, we went to YouTube, of course, and we watched a lot of YouTube video, and some poor student ended up trying to find videos that look the same the same video content, the same soundtrack, and if they're identical, more or less, for the viewer, we call them a clone set. Then we went and, and looked at cat videos, identified a clone set. Now, the nice thing with that is that these are, have the same content, so we can actually control for the content and look at these factors that pe people have felt actually are impacting the, 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 the content, content popularity. Okay, so, so that's the basic idea. Now, how did we do, go upon evaluating this? Well, what we wanted to look at, how do various factors impact the current popularity? So the views we're going to see the next week. And, and typically, again, what you do is you, uh, you take all the videos you have, and you do a linear regression. Okay? So you have some factor of interest, and look at how it's Im impact on, on the popularity. What we did here to approximate that, well, we focus on the clones, and, and we, we, we do a, a linear fitting of this, and, and, and that's sort of to match what, what a typical research paper would do. Then we said, well, okay, let's, let's look separately at the dogs. Let's separately at the cats and, and see what relationships we get. But then we also have to remember that maybe the dogs are just more popular, so they per time unit accumulate more as an aggregate than, than the cat movies. Uh, so, so what we can do is we can build a model that take the, the difference into content account. And, and, and that's, I guess, uh, this factor over here. So, so, so now we have a model that can look at all these things. And, and essentially all we needed to do was to do some analysis. We needed to identify these clones in total, we had 48 clone sets with a, a median of, of about 30 per, per clone set. Okay. And, and then we collected some, some other statistics around these, these clone sets. The interesting thing here is that, I guess here, here's sort of some, some more background. So I mean, we did sort of the standard things with, with using various statistical tools, and, and we did sensible transformation in, in terms of log transformations were very applicable, etc. But having done, done that, we, we could now identify, well, what are the most important factors that matters? Well, even when we count for content popular or differences in content, the total view count still matters the most. And the bit to age impacts a, a lot when, when accounting for this. 
Okay. Now, the rich get richer. So again, people have said that, well, there's this behavior, this relationship between the, the total views thus far and to the next week. Well, what does it mean, rich get richer? Well, let's look a little bit closer at it. If this alpha value is exactly one, we have scale-free attachment. So, so let's correspond to essentially, regardless of how much money you have in your bank account, you have the same interest rate. Now, with alpha is less than one, whoever has less money in their bank account get a higher interest rate than whoever has a lot of money. And in the extreme case, we have super linear, so alpha is greater than one, whoever has much money in their bank account get a higher interest rate than whoever has little. And now we just translate it to the video context. So instead, instead of bank accounts, we're just thinking in, in terms of videos. And it turns out that, well, if, if we do this type of linear fitting, uh, we get some alpha values for, for these different, different models. <coughs> and if we account for uh, differences in popularity, we get something that appears to be scale-free. So it's essentially one. Okay? Whereas if we do like what, what the prior research had done, we don't get scale free. So, so, so we get something that suggests that the rich get richer, but not at the rate you would if everybody had the same interest rate. Okay? Which is it's a little bit counterintuitive. But it just is because you're sort of mix, mix apple and oranges before you do this, this linear fitting. So essentially what we've done is we've developed and applied a clone methodology that allow us to account both quantitatively and qualitatively for, for, for this effect. Uh, and then we, we, we make these observer, observations regarding rich get richer. Essentially, if you don't account for content, you might draw, draw wrong for the con con conclusions. And then in the paper, there, there, there's a little bit sort of more, more depth, and, and, and we look at a little bit more factors. Uh, but, but sort of the general take home message is you need to account for the content. To, to be able to say you do an apple to apple comparison. So that's the first lesson. The second thing I wanted to talk about was, well, okay, if we now seen that we have this distribution globally, and, and then we start doing measurements at, at the edge, do we see the same thing? Turns out that yes, we see the same thing, just sort of watered down. Now, so, so in this, this work, I guess, uh, what we're interested in is, is this type of YouTube content. So YouTube movies are added, people view them, and then they sort of disappear. Nobody watched them again. But the whole time there's new content being added. So, so, so there's a, sort of a, a temporarity there. And then a few videos, they become these long-term long popular things that <clears throat> give, give us, gives us the rich get richer. But it turns out that this tail is very, very heavy, and on an edge network, the majority of, of videos are gonna get a single hit, or sorry, a single view. So if I now put a cache in my network, there's a single view, I'm gonna put it in my cache, nobody's gonna access that one again. So putting something in the cache will have moved something out of the cache, so I now get cache misses just because of that. So, this content can be very damaging to, to, to regular caching LRU type techniques. So what we wanted to do was, well, try to understand, can, can we do better? And so what we did was we, we measure all the, the network traffic in and out of, I guess, University of Calgary. Uh, and, and then we identified people watching these YouTube movies. So over 20 months, we observed 2.3 million videos and, and 5.5 million views. So, so on average, in a week, there, there was about 60K to, I guess, 120K uh, views in a week on, on campus. Now, then we identified, well, let's look at the CDF. And, and if you look at the, the very left, 
what we see is that 71% of the videos are these one-timers. They're only accessed a single time. It's a pretty large number. People have done similar measurements recently for, for web content where it's around sort of the 70-75% as well. So, so it's not only video. The, the conclusion here is going to be, be more widely general. Okay, so, so this means that these sort of uh, selective caching policies are, are needed. We also see, if we look at the CCDF, we see this sort of power law type behavior, which is tightly related to, to the SIF. So based on that, what we want to do is we want to understand the one-timers. So, so we want to understand what is it that is special with these one-timers. So, so what we did in addition to look at the, uh, the network, network traffic on campus, we took all the videos we saw, we went to the YouTube site, collected all the metadata for those ones, and tried to learn what is it that's different with the one-timers versus other, other content. And some of the things that we saw was that, well, some, some content type, like movies, shows, and trailers, they see less uh, one-timers. We also saw a strong, as you would expect, a strong negative correlation between the global popularity and one-timers. So, for example, among the videos that globalists see more than 100 million views, we see a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of one-timers. Whereas for, for videos that, that sort of see in the, in the 1 to 100 or 100 to 10k range, there's tons of, of one-timers. Now, we did sort of model fitting based on different timelines, and, and in all cases we get pr pr pretty good matches. Based on that, we developed a model, so a mathematical model, for, for a policy that cache on case access. So rather than caching on the first axis, we can cache on the second, the third axis, and so forth. Uh, but how good is that? Well, we need to know maybe cache on the second axis is best, better than cache on first axis, but are there more improvements? So to do that, we consider an oracle policy where we have assume exact knowledge of the number of views, as well as oracle with limited knowledge where we have binary knowledge. Is, is this video going to have more than x or less than x views? Is it going to if more than x? We know the exact total, so we're good on predicting really popular videos. Or the case where we're very good on predicting the number of views for things that are going to be one, two, and three timers, for example. And, and, and what we want to know is, well, how much gap is there between these ones? So we took the mathematical models, and we also took these traces. So we had 20 months of, of YouTube traces, and, and we plugged them in. And, and the results are, are fairly similar, as, as you see on the left and the right. But there's a noticeable gap when, when, when we try, try to... Uh, when we are really good at predicting these things that are going to become super popular, it doesn't really help us much. So there's a huge gap here in terms of what these oracle policies that the perfect prediction give us for these popular things. Okay. So all this work that do great prediction to decide what's going to be super popular, completely useless in this context. On the other hand, if we could predict what is going to obtain one or two views, we actually close this gap. We're now down here. So essentially what we want is we want prediction for what is not going to become popular, not what is going to become super popular. Okay. So we have this gap that suggests there is plenty of room for improvement. Uh, and we know that if we can predict these one-timers, we will close the gap. Uh, we've also sort of validated this by, by looking at sort of the SSD cases where we look at the read-write ratio and the cache miss rate, and the conclusions are, are the same. In, in this context, too, again, we, we want to predict what's going to be, be less popular. Now, so how do we close the gap? 
Well, essentially we want to leverage biases in the probabilities for these one-timers to, to predict them. So, so if we look at, uh, in the paper we have many, many examples, but, but one thing we can look at is, is the inter-request time between, say, the first and the second request, or the first and the third. Okay. Now, what we're going to see is that when we have very close the initial request, these things are going to be uh, less likely to be, be one-timers, so more likely to be, be re requested again. So what we can do is we can use that. We can also uh, use other things such as, so I guess, based on that, we come up with this inter-request threshold on, on the case request. But we can also do other things like age based threshold based on the first. So it turns out that a video that is very, very young when it's first requested is more likely to not become a one-timer. So based on these ones, we devise various policies such as these ones. Turns out that they give some small amount of improvement. So if we look very, very, very closely at this one, so there's a little bit of red below the blue. And that means that, okay, we can achieve a little, a little improvement by, by using the, the inter-request times. And if you look very, very closely here, the green one is pushed down a little bit. But you, you see there's very, very small improvements. And turns out that if you look at other things like the video categories, etc., it's very difficult to push this, this line down. Uh, so, what, so what we did was we, we derived some, some models to, to, to give some more in, intuition about this. Again, ma mathematical models. But, but it, 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 it gives some insights for, for why this, this is a diff difficult problem. Uh, so in summary, I think I'm going to do this one fairly quickly. We've, we've measured at the edge YouTube videos over 20 months. We've seen that there's a lot of one-timers, so 71%. Uh, we've also seen that it followed power law that motivated this uh, novel modeling techniques. Using the modeling as well as the trace based, we could see that, well, uh, there is this gap, potential gap for improvement by essentially deciding what not to cache. So by avoiding caching at the first, we can improve things. But the problem is that we would like to be able to predict really, really well what is going to become a one-timer, two-timer, three-timers. And that's a very, very hard problem to, 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 to solve. But the nice things for everybody in this room, it's an open problem. I mean, most of the work is predicting what's going to be super popular. Here, here you have an open problem. It's hard, but there's room, lots of room for improvements. Okay. Now, so, so that hopefully says a little bit about popularity dynamics at the globally, as well as in the edge. Now what I want to do is I want to move over to a completely different topic. And, and I'm going to talk about uh, essentially this idea that we use more and more use Facebook, Google, etc. to log in to our favorite services. So what does that mean? Well, in addition to logging in, we can read things from Facebook in, in, in these other pages, but these pages also upload things to, to Facebook, for example. And we're interested in sort of the, the privacy implications that, that have on, on users. So, so what is this landscape? Well, essentially we have identity provider, like Facebook, like Google, that these relaying parties use to allow users to, to log in. So we have IDPs, we have RPs. So why do we have that? Well, by not needing as many uh, login accounts, we can hopefully be able to easily out authenticate. But the problem is that there's a lot of information leakage between these different sites. So essentially, I, I use my RP, I, I click on my Google thing, I go, come to Google, I log in. When I log in, I have to do agree on, on some terms. And, and these terms essentially tell me 
what will be shared between the, these sites. So there's sort of a, a hidden relationship be between these sites, or not so hidden. <laughs> so, so what we wanted to do as well, how does this landscape look, look in general? So, so what we did was we, we took the top million, so Alexa sites, and, and then we knew we couldn't crawl every single one of them. So what we did was we, we put this axis on, on log scale, and then we sampled linearly on the log scale. So essentially we get uh, more samples of the most popular, but because we have a long tail, we're still going to get tons of samples for, for the less, less popular ones. Now, for each of those sites, what we did was we implemented a, a Selenium crawl tool that identified clickable objects where you can type, type things in into, and do sort of login attempts. And, and, and then we crawled each, each site down to, to depth two. And then we identified things like content sharing relationships as well as, as these uh, IDP relationships. And, and then we sort of compared the content delivery system, so third-party CDNs, as well as the IDPs. So they're both third-party providers, but what's their differences? Well, the IDPs are typically much more popular sites, like Facebook, Google, whereas the content providers, well, the, these are these Akamai, etc. So that's a fairly obvious thing. Uh, the other big thing is that you end up using much more local services for these IDPs. So these ones are local to North America, these ones are local in China for IDPs. Whereas the content is less, the content is, is less. So we see much more focus to the region you're in. Uh, we also see that which sites are using this? Uh, well, it's news, file sharing, social portal, file sharing, etc. Uh, we also see that the traditional sort of identity providers were typically used by, by tech sites. So they, there you only used it for identity provision, not so much for, for, for con content sharing. Uh, yeah, so, and, and then the obvious thing, well, the, the CDN and ad services don't really use these services. So, so some obvious things, some, some in intuitive things. Perhaps more interesting is these privacy risks. So I guess here is this idea that, well, when I use Google or Facebook, well, there's a relationship between, say, uh, the site that I'm logging into and, and this site. So the site is allowed to get some information from Facebook, Google, but depending on the rights that I give this one, it can give update on my behalf on Facebook, Twitter, Google, etc. Okay, so clearly this has some privacy rates. Now, what we did was we we did targeted login tests and manually sort of followed 200 sites or 200 plus sites, I should say, uh, over three years. So, so every three months on average, we we went in and we did login <coughs> tests and. Uh, collected all this, this manual in information. And, and, and then in the end, we did a, a risk analysis of how it cha changed over time. So what trends have we seen over, I guess this data is for, for, for two, two and a half years. But so, so here we've seen an increase of 24% of a protocol called OAuth. So, so what is different with OAuth compared to these other protocols like uh, OpenID? Well, essentially, it gives more flexibility to exchange information. So we've gone from something that is fairly privacy-preserving to something that allows much richer data to be exchanged be between web websites. Okay. So that's one, one big trend. The other thing is that, in general, there's been a big increase. So, so I guess here we're looking at a, a three-year data set. So we went from 69 RPs and added another 15. We initially observed 180 relationship, and then we added another 33. <coughs> so these things are becoming more and more used. We also see that 75% of the RPs select from the top five. 
So all the relationships with these RPs are, are in the top five. So who are the top five? Well, the ones you would get, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Yahoo, and QQ. Now, in combination, we see many things like Facebook, Twitter, uh, QQ and Sina, Facebook and, and Google. And why do I put up the, the relationships? Well, one interesting thing is that in some cases, RPs can get information from Facebook and post on Twitter. So if the sites, the rights are set in, in such a way, no problem. So, turns out that, in fact, among RPs that pick to have at least two IDPs, the fraction of sites with, that allow actions is higher than, than the ones that only have a single site or, or a single I, IDP. So, so this, this result in, in risk or potential IDP le leakages. So, so essentially, we might get something from Facebook, posted on, on Google. Uh, in general, the RPs have, have implemented these things fairly poorly. In some cases, they allow things, but things just crash. In other things, you have the, this risk of, of information leakages. Uh, in addition to that, we have cases where for information to flow from RP to RP, or where we have Knowns that is both an RP and an IDP and, and, and can hence get information from one place, uh, manipulate it, put it somewhere else, potentially. Now, many of these sites don't, but, but they have the rights to do it. Okay. So, so I, th I think I want to say a few, few words about this one. So I guess we have information from one RP that through an IDP can go down to this one. So is this a real problem or is it just an artificial problem? Well, so what we did was we looked at the rights that these RPs have to a common IDP. So in total, we observed uh, a whole bunch of RPs using Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Google, sort of manually. So, so, so we focus on, on the English speaking here. And we identified 645 cases where, where you can leak information this way through Facebook by the actual information flowing that way. 473 uh, about a year later. So why was there a decrease here? Well, during that time span, Facebook improved their, their app rights. They made them more privacy preserving, and it helped. But, but clearly, there, there's still a long, long way to go. But Facebook have taken some initiative. Google, I think, as well, is, is trying to, to sort of dampen the, these possibilities. Uh, so, I mean, at, at a high level, we, we try to characterize this landscape. We identify some, some interesting things, uh, mostly related to, to, to pri privacy risks uh, and, and sort of the, the infor information leakages, the protocol usage. And, and again, uh, by doing it over time, uh, I think we have a, a sense where things are heading that, that we didn't have when, when, when we started the, the, the project. So, so at least we're more enlightened, and I, I, I hope you, you, you have a, a little bit of a sense for, for, for where this, this landscape is heading now. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, sort of so, some comments about sort of my uh, my main child right now. Uh, so, so, I mean, th this isn't measurement uh, research, but, but it is something that I, I think is sort of emerging more, more and more. And, and, and I think it will change what we see in the, in the networks. So it's sort of these more immersive experiences. So, so what, what we're thinking here is essentially, well, everything is getting more and more personalized. So, I mean, we're getting personalized search queries, we're getting personalized this, we get personalized that. But if you think of the video content, all we're getting is, well, we get suggestions on which videos to watch. Okay. 
I want to be able to change the content. I want to be able to watch a variation of the movie that is personalized for me, not for every single person on earth. Okay? So, but, but this is something that's fairly unexplored. So, so what we did a couple of years ago was we wanted to provide people essentially the following. So essentially, we've all seen a video that in our taste is too sad, too violent, too scary, or where our favorite character have made dumb choices, regardless if it's Tom or if it's Goofy. I mean, they all make things that make you think, why would, would they do that? If I only would have been in control, I would have done something else. Well, what we do is we try to provide you with that. So essentially, you start watching a movie, and as you watch the movie, you're given brand choices. You can either go up or down. Okay, I go here. Now I'm given three choices. I go here and, and so forth. So, so as you go through the movie, you click your way through. But you want to be able to do this essentially by, by say, say the skateboarder is going towards this ramp. And you don't want to get sort of a frozen picture and then make the choice. You want to be able to click on these things before he hits the ramp, and at that point you want to choose which trick, trick he makes. And if you're not quick enough to click, well, he should make the, the, the choice for you. And, and, and you can imagine interfaces that, that look a little bit different. So this is a training exercise for, for a staff, uh, a servant, or, or a person ser serving food, where you click different choices, and depending on that, the move is sort of your continue along. Now, the problem that we've solved is essentially the following. We don't want to see this guy. Nobody likes to see this one. So essentially what we do is we combine H2P adaptive streaming with path quality reverb prefetching. So we prefetch from all these branches so to meet all the delay requirement, regardless of which path you, you choose. Okay. So what is HTTP assisted streaming? Well, with HTTP based streaming, the video is split into chunks. This allows easy firewall traversal, caching, easy support of uh, interactive video. Then with adaptive version of that, we essentially split each chunk in different quality levels. And then, well, the nice thing with that is that if I'm now going to play this video, so, so to the right, I start at a low quality. If, if I notice that, well, I get the chunks quicker than I play them out, again, I'm going to get more and more buffered. So at that point, I might say, well, I'm going to choose a higher quality. I stay at that level until I notice that my buffer continue to fill up, at which time I, I pick a higher quality, and then so forth. Okay. So how can we use this to achieve this goal where we essentially want to prefetch along both paths? Well, the nice thing is that, well, we just need to measure everything. How soon is it to that playback or, or this branch point? What qualities can I fit within the time span that I have before I reach that so that I get everything before that branch point? So the essential solution is to combine branch with you and has. Uh, the goal is to provide seamless playback without these interruptions. So how is the problem really solved? Well, optimization. Okay. So we want to maximize the quality given the playback deadlines and bandwidth conditions. So essentially, we have an op optimization problem where we maximize the playback quality. We can write it out quality over some number of segments for the current one, and for the first ones after the branch point. With any optimization problem, we need some constraints. Well, what are the constraints in this case? Well, it's a send, well, the first thing I should say, sorry. Uh, we need a, a download order. So in, in this case, we download one, two, three, then we reach the branch point. We assume that we have the highest weight to four. So we're gonna download that one, seven, 10 round robin, and if we have more, we download 5, 8, 11, and so forth. When we clicked and, and decided on the middle path, we would just continue with that one in the same, same way, and then round robin, okay? Now, we need constraints. 
that, that, that's what I said. So, so essentially, each shank need to be downloaded a bit before they play playback deadline. So all you need to do now is essentially write out some constraints. So the current completion time for a sec or a shank I need to be before its playback deadline, where the playback deadline essentially consists of the startup delay plus the time that it takes to play, play out those chunks. And of course, if, if you look at the, the playback deadlines for these ones, they're all at, at the point of the branch point. So we need to have gotten all those three before the branch point, so we can write out an equation in terms of the download completion time need to be before uh, startup delay plus the playback of one, two, and three. So essentially we've designed and implemented this branch video player. Uh, it's freely available. Uh, you can download it, you can play around with it. Uh, we've done some generalizations of it where, where you sort of provide uh, prefetching of other videos so that when you get bored watching a regular video, you can hit play and you get instant playback rather than sort of having to download the first few chunks at, at that time. So it can be implemented with, with really any recommendation, any in, in, in the background. Uh, so, so, so hopefully that gives some ideas. Uh, we're sort of excited about this area. But the reason I bring this up is, well, I said that we have this uh, one-timer problem. Okay? Imagine now that each vid you have many, many branch points. Okay? You have many, many branch options. So now the rare content might become even more rare. We're going to see even more one-timers. And because of the chunking, we're not going to see large videos being, being cached. We're going to see a smaller, smaller objects be, being cached. So, so many of these things will have big Im implications on what, what, what we see in the networks. So in summary, we've, we've now seen uh, popularity at a global scale, what makes the dogs so much more <coughs> fantastic than the cats. Oh, sorry. Uh, that movie being more popular than the other one. Uh, we've seen implication on, on the edge. Uh, we've seen uh, the privacy leakage risks with, with using third-party authentication. And we've seen some, uh, some things that, that I'm very excited about in, in, in terms of branch, branch video and, and sort of per personalized experience, video experiences. Uh, and, and I hope, hopefully put it, put it in the context of, of, of the general, general research. So with that, I want to thank, thank you all for, for, for listening and uh, have, happy to take uh, quick questions if you have any. So you, you, you recorded um, all of video views in, in a university over a couple of months, right? How do you do, do that? Is, isn't the traffic to YouTube and encrypted? Oh, okay, so, so this, this was, uh, the data is from between, uh, what is it, July 2008 to March 2010, I think. So, so at that time, you, YouTube didn't, didn't encrypt. So, 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 so what we did was we, we took all the HTTP requests and sort of stitched them together into sessions and, and identified the uh, views. But, but yeah, now uh, it's much, much more difficult. But we, we have re research lo looking at that. Yeah. Just maybe a very, very simple question. Maybe. Uh, so you are uh, going for a scalable video streaming, and you are suggesting a player that is, uh, that is scalable to the uh, choice of content, correct? Uh, in, 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 in some, yeah, I mean, that, that, that one is more per, per personalized and scalable, yeah. Right. So, so uh, how are you achieving that scalability? Are you opening multiple parallel HTTP connections? Or is oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, that, that, that one isn't so much about scalability. But uh, yes, we, 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 we do op 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 open mul multiple connections. So I mean, the optimization problem, that, as I described it, uh, I didn't really say anything about parallel connections. But when, when we consider the case of parallel connection, what, what we do is uh, we make the conservative assumption that 
if I currently have this bandwidth with a single connection, we say, okay, if I open up two connections, I'm not going to get any more bandwidth. But that one is going to be split between two. And then I solved the optimization problem for, for that case. Because that's very interesting from a developing world perspective, uh, where you have a very dynamic uh, last mile uh, bandwidth constraints. Yeah. And you need a very scalable, uh, uh, robust video streaming protocols that are adapting their uh, data streaming rates, as yeah. you mentioned, 250 and 500 plus, that's what you said. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and I mean, we, we, we do look at parallel connections. One, one thing that we haven't looked at is that, that some video streaming services do in, is in terms of, if, if you now have chosen too high of a quality, uh, what some streaming services do is they cancel that download and then open up a download for the same chunk at a lower quality. And, 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 and those type of optimizations we, we haven't looked at. This is sort of just uh, using the default uh, of an open source uh, player that uh, for, for, for this, uh, this implementation. But if you're going for a live streaming of your data, then you have the control, right? You yeah. are generating the content and you are playing it with your subscribers. Yeah. So then uh, you can make it scalable according to the network conditions at the time you selected those data rates. Uh, I suppose, yeah. yeah so I mean, here, 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 here we're looking at uh, video on demand only. Yeah. Do we have a question about that? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I have one question about your first part. Um, you talked about the richer getting richer, and it's coming from a financial perspective. So does this still hold true if it comes to the internet community, which is evolving pretty fast and losing interests in some topics and getting interest in another topic? Uh, yes. So, 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 so it, 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 it seems like it's not only that context, but uh, many, many, many other con contexts as well. Uh, okay. so, 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 so not, not only internet and, and not only financial. Yes. Yeah, so did your data show like a decline over some time? So it's, I guess it's not like a really growing stops sometimes because like Halloween outfits are not. Yeah, so, 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 so I should, I mean, in, in, in the papers I described here, we don't look at it, but we have a performance evaluation paper from 2011 where, where what we did was we monitored, uh, I think, a couple of million YouTube videos over time. So it's so a weekly snapshot oh, for, yes. for, for about a year. And, and, and what you see there is that uh, the time to, to peak is, is sort of uh, heavy tail. So, so, so you have some videos that ne never really uh, sort of peak, uh, whereas the majority peak fairly soon. So, so the majority is this sort of uh, ephemeral popularity that, that, that we discuss here. But then you have others that almost never peak. And, and what we do in that one, we, we develop a model where you videos have a time to peak, and during that time they become more and more popular. And then after they peak, they become less and less popular. But, but these long-term popular ones are, are sort of a special case. But those are the ones that many of us are, are, are viewing too. So, so, so from a global perspective, th those are interesting. But from the local yes. caching, it's, it's less interesting. So we have a question. So do you see that in your YouTube galaxy? So in a way, you agree that it's quite old now. It's like seven years ago. And What's your opinion? Like, because we have changed the way that we use internet over the last seven years a lot, yeah. and then how videos get distributed, and the devices that we use, yeah. is those findings are still valid? Yes. You think so? Yeah. So, 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 so I mean, uh, uh, the the the, the one-timer phenomenon. Uh, uh, so Akamai people had a had a paper in CCR. 2015, and, and, and again, one in eEnergy 2016, where, where they look at the access to, to the web content, and it followed the same distribution. So, so I mean, uh, what we're interested in there is just, we have this long tail of, of, of less popular things. Uh, yes, I mean, if, if, if you look at YouTube content now, it's, it's split into chunks. Well, not really chunks, but, uh, uh, they, they use range requests to things that more or less are chunks. So, so each video, in some sense, see requests for, for multiple qualities. And, and, 
and in their internal things have now these 5.005 second chunks. Uh, and I mean, that we didn't have to deal with at all here. So in terms of YouTube being representative here compared to how it's now, not at all. But in terms of seeing this heavy tail with a lot of one-timers, that, that I think is, is very representative, not only of uh, videos traffic, but also in, in terms of web traffic. But, as, as I argued, uh, I think this tail is going to be, become even heavier, or, or uh, not heavier, longer, uh, as, as, as uh, we get more and more per personalization. Simplest way to identify clones, clones, simplest automated way to identify those clones, because you group the clones together. Uh, so at that time it was easy, mm -hmm. because YouTube wasn't trying to hide clones. Mm -hmm. Today, YouTube is trying to remove clones. Mm -hmm. so, so, so doing the same thing today would be much more harder than, than we, we did. We need some future extractions. Yeah. So, so, so I think YouTube themselves have identified ways of, of identifying clones and, and then hiding them for, for us. Okay. Any more questions? Um, so, uh, what you did is uh, basically video on demand or popularity analysis for video on demand. Do you think that live streaming video, which is getting increasingly popular, is a completely different game or is there any comparison? Because I can think that those providers who stream uh, this data in real time to, to their users, they want to predict, <coughs> for example, how many uh, users will be active in, in the next hour or on the next stream uh, in the next morning or whatever? Yeah, yeah so, so I mean, uh, one event, yeah, so, 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 so it's a little bit different. So I mean, if, if I'm a, a content provider with a limited catalog, which you per default have if you do live, uh, I mean, unless you're a very unpopular service, I mean, you, you, you're not gonna see this long tail. I mean, YouTube have massive amounts of content, so, so, so you will see all the, these one-timers. But, but, but if I look at, at the regional TV provider, uh, they only have, say, the last two weeks of, of content uploaded, and, and if you look at live, they have one or, or, or two parallel streams. So, I mean, you, you will have much more concentration of what, what, what pe people are viewing there. So, 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 so it will impact the, the, the distribution curves. And, and then I guess with uh, uh, the, the chunking, all those things, people are doing both in the live and in, in the VOD context. So, so, so I hope that sort of answered your, 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 your question. So why do we need to give right access to live parties? Um, you don't have to. In that case, we don't have any problem of uh, consistency or integrity, right? Well, you, you, you might have problem using the service. So, so, so I mean, you, you always have the option not to use them, right? But if, if, if you want to use, say, with with one of these RPs, you, you want to use Facebook as, as a as IDP provider. That RP will ask you to agree on those things. You can always opt out, but then you might not be able to use Facebook as, as, as the identity provider. Uh, some of them are, are providing you to opt out and opt in out of some options. So, so Facebook is becoming much, much better at that. But I mean, in the end, it's the the RP that decide, uh, do I, am I okay with only this information? And, and if they are, then it works. Uh, if not, you might not be able to use their, their, their service. But, that that but, is fine. So I was just wondering if we can find any motivation why any RP has to write something to, to my IDP. As, yeah, so, so, so some RP is, so, so I should say, I mean, we, we looked at the default settings, and, and again, you, you can sometimes allow them to do more, you can allow them to do less. Uh, but yeah, even in the default settings, some, some RPs don't ask for, for actions to, to do 
on, on let's say, Google or, or Facebook. They, they only allow to download some, some basic information. So read, reading is fine. So if, if they ask for, for reading access, that's fine. But I was just wondering, because at IDP we have more uh, stable information in the form of name, date of birth, place of birth, or address. So why someone has to modify that information? It's not clear. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so one, one interesting case there, I mean, now I'm sort of going into special cases. But one, one thing that I noticed that's sort of fun with that is, I mean, you can have Facebook, you can have Google, or Facebook and Twitter. And, and you might have provided slightly different names on those. And, and now if you try to use both of them for the same RP, uh, sometimes it, things work very, very, very poorly. Or, or they might not even allow you to, to use both because of these, these conflicts. But again, those are more sort of engineering details rather than sort of fun fundamentals. Thank you. Any more questions?